in Honda and Croiso um, to our professionally speaking event for 2024, which is entitled Unlocking the Mysteries of Learning with Professor Sharon Ensworth. We're so glad that Sharon can join us today from Nottingham. Um, on a few housekeeping notes, please. Can you make sure that your cameras and your mics are off? You will be able to unmute and turn your own microphones on during the event as there are some interactive parts to the event and it will all become clear later. There is going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions to Sharon in the Q&A at the end of the event, but please do feel free to use the chat bar to ask questions at any point during the talk, or you can ask verbally and we'll ask you to raise your hand during the session at the end if you wish to do that. You can also use the chat function to engage with other participants throughout the event or indeed to ask any EWC member um, of staff a question directly. Our team will be monitoring the chat throughout and will collect any questions ready for the question and answer session. If it happens that you lose connection at any time, please just rejoin with the original link and you'll be able to get yourself back in again. We have a Welsh interpreter available, so we encourage any Welsh speakers to contribute through the medium of Welsh. If you're not a Welsh speaker, make sure that you select the interpretation globe at the bottom of your screen and select English so that you can hear the translation. The event is being recorded and will be available as a video on our website within the month. And finally, we will be sharing on our social media channels throughout the event and we would encourage you to do so as well. Please tag us in and it's at EWC in capitals underscore CGA on Twitter or X and search for Educational Workforce Council in Wales um, so that we can share your messages. And I'm now going to hand over to Andrew Townsend and Andrew is Professor of Education and Head of the Department of Education and Childhood Studies in Swansea University. Andrew, over to you. Thank you. Dioch, Prin Handar, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it falls to me to introduce this talk, but also to introduce our speaker, Sherman Ainsworth. The topic today is unlocking the mysteries of learning. This is important to me for many reasons. I am an ex-teacher. I was a science teacher for 10 years. I'm now a professor of education and head of department. It's important, I think, for us to have a strong understanding of the learning sciences, to appreciate how what is understood in the learning sciences can inform our work as educators. This is something that has been discussed frequently recently with increasing frequency, I believe. It is very widely reported and promoted popularly uh, on social media, for example. However, I don't think it is always done in a way that is really accurate or helpful to educators. There are a lot of myths being promoted. Some of the work that's being presented is outdated. And I think it really does uh, sometimes fail to properly acknowledge the role of educators, their experience and expertise and their roles with learners. But I think it is nonetheless very important for us um, as educators to have a good understanding of foundational underpinnings from the psychology of learning and from learning sciences. This, I think, can help us to better understand how to do our work. It doesn't mean that that knowledge is better than our experience, and it doesn't mean that our experience is better than the knowledge. In my view, the two really are complementary and should serve to support each other. I think in respect of the work of the EWC, it is also something which can contribute to the professional code or of professional conduct and practice, and particularly points four and five referring to professional knowledge and understanding professional learning. So as a topic, I think it's a really useful one for us to engage with, to ask questions about how we can learn from this, but also what the implications for our practice might be but in doing so to also recognize that educators have their own expertise and knowledge on which they draw and that combining the two is, is the strongest way to approach education. So why Sharon? Well, I think the first thing to say is that I've known Sharon for 
really quite a long time now. Perhaps we don't want to go into details for just how long. But it's not just that. It is that I believe Sherwin has the knowledge to be able to communicate this topic to us. I believe Sherwin has the communication skills to be able to do so in such a way that it's useful to us. And I believe that Sherwin also has the disposition to be able to understand the significant role of educators and the ways in which they can support learners. Sharon has an interdisciplinary background. Unlike me, Sharon was not a teacher or a teacher educator for that matter. She has worked in disciplines as diverse as chemistry, psychology, artificial intelligence, and now learning sciences. She is now a professor of the learning sciences and director of the Learning Sciences Research Institute uh, at Nottingham University. At Nottingham, she spent 20 years working in the psychology department before moving to education, where she has been uh, now for 10 years. Sharon's work um, is around topics relating to learning, particularly how cognitive engagement can arise through effective engagement. Things like drawing, animation, educational games. Sharon is interested in the way that serious engagement can arise from way from approaches that don't feel onerous to learners or indeed to educators. There are some real highlights in her work. Um, Sarah published a, a, a um, paper in Science, which is on drawing to learning science, an important topic um, for any science teacher, uh, as I know from my own experience. And Sharon's highest cited paper is in a journal called Learning and Instruction and uh, is about a conceptual framework for considering learning with multiple representations. And at the time of speaking has over 2,400 citations. So it's extremely widely read and cited, achieving over 200 citations often per year. All of that might demonstrate her academic credibility to be able to speak with authority on this topic. But I can tell you what you will be discovering soon for yourselves. And that is that Sharon also has a keen understanding of the need for educators to be respected and for their professional roles to be understood. And the place of uh, uh, learning sciences research um, and knowledge to play a contribution to that in a way which supplements, is complementary to and supports, but is not presented as a solution or to replace the experience of educators. I also know from experience that Sharing is an en engaging and interesting speaker, and I'm sure you'll discover that for you as well. So, Sharon, over to you. I think that's a little bit under the time I was given, so a, a couple of minutes back to you. Thank you very much. Kind of follow that. Right, let me just start by sharing my screen, and then I will just double check that it's coming in the way we would all like it to come. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm not going to spend any time talking about myself. Let's just get stuck in. And uh, the very first thing I would like to do is uh, ask you a question. So many, many um, professional development programs, many initial teacher education programs ask our um, young people to consider, is teaching an art or a science? It's not a new question. Um, I'm going to ask you it now. And what I'd like you to do is imagine that you have to pick one of these answers. You have to say science, uh, teaching is an art. It's about creative expression. It's about en engaging in the form. Um, there aren't any rules. There is no kind of underpinning knowledge. Or you could say, no, science, uh, teaching is science. Teaching is, it's rule driven, there are practices, there's knowledge that can be learned and that can be disseminated and passed on to, uh, to, to one another in these kind of principled ways. And the first thing then, and you've got to pick one or the other, imagine I'm just going to zoom around Wales and I'm going to steal your firstborn if you don't pick one of these two answers. No sitting on the fence, no saying it's complicated, we're just going to pick one or the other. So for, to start with, um, could you raise your hands using that Zoom reaction button if you think that teaching is best considered an art? I'm just going to whiz over to the chat and see how many of you say art. Come here, nice. 
that's about 30, 40% maybe. Okay, if you could stick your hands down, everyone. And now, because you know the rules, because you know I'm stealing your firstborn, uh, everybody else is um, gonna pick science, right? Come back. So teaching is a science. I am going to say that art has called it. I might be wrong. I am also going to say that you're a bunch of naughty students and most of you have disobeyed the instructions and I need to come and steal your first forms. Excellent for me. Simplistic, can't be done. What a pointless exercise. So of course, most of us probably don't think it's easy to say teaching as an art or teaching as a science. Maybe we would be happier if I'd phrase the question as where on the continuum between art and science do you think teaching sits? And maybe if we were all in a big room together, we could stand along a wall from it's completely art, it's completely science, and we could spread ourselves out like that. Um, we might even be fancy and say, actually, Sharon, it's not art, it's not science, it's the intersection of art and science. Maybe that solves the problem. Well, I'm gonna say the, the view that you could say is associated with learning sciences is teaching isn't art, teaching isn't science, teaching is architecture. And when we look at a building like this, so this is Zaha Hadid's um, beautiful kind of center in Baku, Azerbaijan, who wouldn't aspire to think about teaching as architecture? So why do I think teaching is architecture? Well, I think, I think it's like this for these following reasons. So architecture is about constructing something new, something that's changing the world in the manner to which you intend it to change. And training to be an architect is a very long process. It's seven years in, um, in England. And why is that? Well, part of it is because architects learn basic principles. They learn the principles of you know, fluid dynamics and properties and chemistry and physics. And often these principles have been developed in pure controlled conditions. But they also systematically study what works in practice. It's not just enough to have principles. You have to go and visit building sites and, and and um, museums and houses and extensions and uh, towns and you really have to understand what works in practice because that's because ultimately architects are becoming professionals with agency they have the knowledge they have the experience and they are permitted to work creatively albeit in um, combination with a client's brief and that's because Therefore, what results from this training is not the idea of there is a perfect building. There is one way to build a house. There is one way to build a bridge. There is one way to build a museum. There's many ways to build beautiful, functional, workable, creative, inspiring museums. So whether we're in Cardiff or Paris or Beijing or St. Petersburg, we've got different creative solutions to the same and overarching issue, how do I build a beautiful museum? And the other thing that we can see perhaps from this slide is the importance of context. You can't take a building that works in Beijing and stick it into Cardiff. You can't stick the one from Cardiff in St. Petersburg and still expect the same effect. So I think what good architects have is they adapt what they're building to the context they find themselves in. A real strong analogy to me for architecture is who deserves good architecture. So I love grand designs. I watch grand designs on, you know, a Tuesday night or a Thursday night, whenever it is. I feel like I've grown up with Kevin MacLeod, watching him and us both get greyer and greyer as the years go on. And in grand designs, he often visits really expensive properties. But I don't think that's where we should look for good architecture. I think everybody deserves good architecture. So if you moved up the road from me in Nottingham, you would end up in Clifton. But that isn't the only choice we need to make about social housing. We could be in the Vale of Gamorgan, we could be in Norwich. And the choices that we've made show us that good architecture is possible, irrespective of the budget.
So that's my pitch. My pitch is teaching and architecture are the same because we're trying to build something with our knowledge, but with our creativity and our vision that fits the context that we find ourselves in. And everybody deserves somewhere good to learn and somewhere good to live. So that's my pitch. How do I think that plays out then? And what's my role in it? So if educators are architects, be that in a museum, be it in a preschool, be it in a school, being in um, a formal learning situation, how can the learning sciences help them build? So simply as a learning scientist, my job is to try and understand how people learn. And when I'm trying to understand how people learn, I look at explanations that um, are neuronal and are based on changes in the brain that happen in literal milliseconds. But also as a learning scientist, I'm interested in every time scale up from that. So I'm interested in how we learn over minutes, hours, years, and even millennia. So Andy's mentioned my own area is often around drawing and representation. To understand that, I look at how we've evolved um, to start using cave paintings 100,000 years ago and what happens when I show you a picture in a scanner. So fascinated by learning at every time scale and in every um, level of system. And also we don't just find ourselves in schools. So learning scientists want to understand where learning happens, wherever it happens, be that in the home, the nursery, the museum, every level of school, um, uh, we're interested in informal contexts. One of my colleagues is fascinated by learning that goes on when you play a pub quiz. I'm fascinated by gaming. Um, and so much of learning happens in a professional context. So we try and build this understanding of learning. And then the idea of a learning scientist, what, where our happy place is, is that we co-design with practitioners. So we try and design a new educational experience that engages um, cognitive affective and social processes. So that's what we try and do. And today, because of the interest in learning sciences around cognition, I thought I'd try and give you a snapshot of how we currently consider the cognitive processes engaged in learning. And a very quick health warning, when I describe myself as a learning scientist, I'm part of a 500 to 1000 person strong international society of learning scientists. Um, that's actually different to a, a group called the learningscientist.org who actually are cognitive psychologists. And it's um, they intersect with the learning sciences, but they overlap only in about one or two percent. Um, and they're quite easy to find in the UK. So I'm not a learningscientist.org. I'm part of the International Society of Learning Scientists. I'm very aware for those of you who know your Monty Python, I sound like that bit from Life of Brian, where they're saying, no, 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 I'm not uh, the Judean people's front, I'm the people's front of Ju Ju Judea. So that being said, what are we going to look at today? Well, we're going to look at this. So if you have any degree of background in psychology, A-level psychology or a degree in psychology, you'll have seen this before. In fact, you could just stick your hand up quickly, a thumb or a wave, if this model of cognition is familiar to you. And I am seeing, yeah, I'm seeing a few hands, but not very many hands. Thank you very much. So for most of you, this is an unfamiliar model. And what I can tell you is it has dominated um, various approaches to understanding uh, the cognitive, the thinking processes involved in learning for around 50 years. So it's a nice, we'll come back. It's a nice model of um, with boxes and arrows. It doesn't necessarily say what's going on in the boxes. Uh, it's, you know, what, 54, 55 years old. It is underpinning some of the uh, curriculum reform we see around initial teacher education in lots of parts of the world, including England, and it's wrong. Anything that has been around for 50 years 
it's not like the field of psychology and cognitive science hasn't learned anything since 1968. 1968 was about 12 years into the cognitive revolution. So about 12 years after we start thinking that we could learn everything there is to understand about people through studying rats. So it's wrong, but it's not completely wrong. So how do we not throw this baby out with the bathwater? How do we keep our baby in our bathwater and move forward? Well, that's one of the, the things that sort of preoccupy me. So here's my model of memory. This is how I think memory works. I think the we've got whole human beings, they're moving around, they're doing stuff, they're reading books, they're looking at their phones, on the walls around them, they might be looking at a graph or a visualization or a television screen. And that's my model of memory. But I am gonna zoom in at before, at the end of this talk, zooming back out again. So I'm gonna zoom in to what's going on in the brain, in the middle of the box. So this is my model of um, cognition. So hopefully you can see that it shares many of the um, boxes that we saw on the earlier model of cognition. So lots of the names on these boxes have not changed, but there are some quite important changes from that old model to this current model, even while we're keeping our baby in our bathwater. So um, one of the things that's changed is that long-term memory, which used to hang around over here on the far right of the the model has moved to a central position and it's moved to a central position because it has a central role to play in every stage of thinking. You might also see that in the first model I showed you, there were a very strong distinction between boxes and arrows. So arrows were like processes going on and boxes were things like storage. We know that isn't the case. So Anything that is also a box, like sensory memory, attention, working memory, I am going to define these in a minute, panic not. Um, it's also a process. It's a dynamic process that's running. So there's not a separation between a process and a store like we might have thought uh, 50 years ago. And also the interaction with the environment is hugely more important. So you can see in in this model, that the way that um, we interact and engage through our senses, our hands, our bodies, our ears, our eyes with the world is centrally important. And we don't just take information in from the environment, we also act on the environment. So that's the model of cognition that I'm going to use. And I'm now going to take you through some of the key components of this model. And hopefully at the end, if there's any questions, uh, you can ask me for a bit more detail. But let's have a look into some of these boxes. And what you can already see from this slide is the arrows go everywhere. They go every which way in, in every direction. That's not an accident, but we are just gonna take one particular pathway through at the beginning before coming back to that at the end. So let's start with sensory memory. So I'm gonna tell you that sensory memory is the part of the system that holds sensory information very, very briefly. Environmental stimuli enter, sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, heat. Um, there are way more than five senses, but let's talk about the big five today. And one of the things we now learn, know about sensory memory, it has a very, very large capacity. Nobody can ever say, my brain is too full, I can't, um, my sense of memory is too full, I can't take in any new information. But we've also learned it's got a very, very short duration. And I'm gonna try and prove this to you now by turning off my screen, wibbling for around three seconds, and then asking you to think about what color my scarf is. You can even stick it into the chat if you want. Some of you may be saying, is she wearing a scarf? I am, what color is it? Have a think, restarting the video. So it's a sort of strange blue and white leopardy spotty thing. Now, some of you, that will have not been a problem. You'll have thought, oh yeah, I noticed that scarf, didn't really like it when she started. Uh, others of you thought, is she wearing a scarf? I don't remember a scarf. And no matter how hard you'll have tried, you won't be able 
to get back that early sensory memory to remember what the scarf was. You can't think yourself back into five seconds ago if you didn't notice it in the first case. This limited duration issue for sensory memory has huge implications for the classroom. If a child hasn't attended, um, then they're not going to be able to attend they're not going to be able to, to, to think themselves back into having attended. It even has implications for stuff like um, driving accidents. So very common uh, thing for when people hit, hit motorcycles or, or bikes, is they say, I looked, but I didn't see it. What we know now is they looked, they were distracted while looking, and so they didn't actually pay attention to it and then it's gone from their sensory memory. So we used to call it the look but don't see error. Now we know it's the look but don't remember error. So sensory memory, really important, huge capacity, but very short duration. And then I was using the word attention. So attention refers to the fact that we cannot deal with any, everything in our, in our environment. We are not processing everything that goes on um, simultaneously. We would be overwhelmed if we did so. We'd not evolved to do that. We have evolved to have selective attention and that limits what we can perceive and what we process at one time. So we're only able to attend to one cognitively demanding task at a time. This comes as a great disappointment to my teenager who would love to tell me that he can be on WhatsApp and revising and watching a YouTube video and playing a game all at the same time. What he does not know and will not believe me is that uh, what's happening is he's switching his attention often from one cognitively demanding task to another. And each time we uh, switch our attention, we have something called a switch cost. And so you will get an overall performance decrease. So attention is selective. If it's cognitively demanding, we can only apply to one of it at once. And what you find cognitively demanding and what you attend to is both strongly affected by your prior knowledge. So your long term memory. So long term memory comes right back into the beginning again to show us that it's what we already know that influences what where we look and where we attend. Now, I don't, don't need to tell you that many, many of you work in classrooms and you will know that when you learn to teach, one of the things you learn to do was learn how to zoom your attention to particular types of the classroom situation. The famous teachers of eyes in the back of their head is the fact that we get very good at knowing where to, to attend. Um, but also every time we start a class again, you know, every new class we learn, we learn, you know, that that is the place in 7B where it always kicks off. So we learn to put particular attention there. So we get very good at uh, our long term memory allows us to use our uh, limited capacity, um, selective attention really, really well. And another thing we do is as we get better and better at something. So uh, with practice, uh, we're able to perform thoroughly learned tasks without much attention at all. So when I drove to the office today, I was uh, listening to a podcast. I think I was listening to off menu. Um, and I could probably tell you, you know, the, the choices that the guest had made on off menu, apart from this one particular part of my driving route where I have to cross a flyover and three lines of traffic merge down to one and two lanes go off. And if you ask me at that point what the guest was discussing, I won't be able to tell you because I've actually swapped all of my attention to managing this particularly complex task. So for the routine part of this thoroughly learned um, situation, um, my attention can cope with both uh, the road and the podcast, but not in this particularly demanding situation. So that's a little bit about attention. Another thing we're going to talk about briefly is working memory. So we started at sensory memory. We then attended to some of the things that were in our environment and hence in our sensory memory. And now we are thinking about them. So things that we are thinking about are held in our working memory. So it's where we hold new information and it's where we integrate uh, this new incoming information with what we've stored in long-term memory. And it has a limited capacity. It's limited, we think, to about three or five chunks of information. 
And I'm going to try and prove that to you by setting you a task. So I'm going to string, to read out to you a set of random numbers. And your job, the minute I clap my hands, is to um, unmute yourself and chant back without fear of embarrassment or shame, the numbers that I have read out to you. And to make it a little bit easier for you, I'm just gonna stop my video so that you don't also have to process my face. So I'll just stop my video by finding my mouse. And then I'm gonna read you some random numbers out. So the random numbers are nine, one, seven, eight, four, zero, zero, four, four, one, one, five, six, seven, this is hard, six, seven, one. Nine one That's someone's typed in the chat. That's cheating. So I'm thinking, unless there are people who have specialised on this call in um, how to recall random numbers, and some people do learn how to do this, all these people that learn Pi, um, you'll have found that quite hard. And you'll have said, that is way more than three or five items of information. How can you expect me to memorise those? And the thing is, I cheated. I often cheat. So I didn't give you random numbers. I gave you my office phone number. So I gave you three random numbers at the beginning to throw you off, 917. But afterwards, I gave you the UK country code, 0044. And then I gave you Nottingham's dialing code, 115. And then I gave you my office extension, which is 67671. Now, that is what we process in our working memory. So if you knew that, and we could repeat the exercise, and I could give you my home phone number, uh, I'm not going to, um, then you would now find it an easier task. It's still going to be cognitively demanding, but rather than try to remember 0, 0, 0044 4 as four individual chunks of information, you're just remembering the UK country code. So that shows you if you know what the UK country code is, it's easier, it's 0, 0, 0044. 4. But even if you don't, knowing that there's that pattern there, you'd probably still find it easier to chunk. So our working memory, its capacity is influenced by what we hold in our long-term memory. It also, I'm afraid to say, has a limited duration. So um, if you don't rehearse stuff, um, it will decay and it likely has multiple specific components. So although I, um, I, I turn my camera off for multiple reasons, uh, one of the things uh, we know is that there's uh, a part of our uh, working memory that focuses for visual spatial information. There's a part of our working memory that focuses on auditory information. So actually, it shouldn't have harmed you too much to be able to see me and hear me simultaneously because you're using two different parts of your working memory. I actually turned my camera off so I could take my scarf off. And I wonder how many of you noticed that whilst your eyes were closed, I removed an item of my clothing, luckily only the scarf. And again, what's that showing you there, hopefully, is attention is selective. You didn't need to attend to my scarf. You weren't thinking about my scarf. Um, so when it changed, your attention didn't notice. We call that change blindness. I've just ruined an awful lot of magic tricks for, for, for you. But again, it's this point that we don't attend to everything that's going on in our environment simultaneously. We just can't, and there's no need to. So that's a little bit on working memory. And it's been a while since I showed you this diagram, so I am going to bring it back again. You might want to mute if you haven't, in case you've got cats and dogs and kids coming in. Um, 
it's been a while since we looked at it and we're now going to move to what I consider to be my favourite part of memory because I am that much of a nerd that I have a favourite part of memory and I'm going to talk to you about long-term memory. You might have noticed we've whizzed through attention again on the way and that's important. Um, attention is involved both externally by what we process in the external world and we often call this internal attention so what we process in the relationship between long-term memory and working or short-term memory. So let's move to long-term memory. It is my favorite part of memory. It's really complicated, but we're gonna make it simple because we're gonna talk about pizza. So our long-term memory is a permanent store of knowledge probably, and by which I mean in the healthy functioning brain, we have not got to the point where just because something was a long ago, it is forgotten. We, do, we all know, we've all got relatives or friends who we've seen uh, with problems of aging, but I'm here talking about the healthy, normal brain. Its capacity is also potentially unlimited. At, the, at our current life cycle of, you know, 100, up to 100 years, it, you shouldn't run out of space. It's not like a filing cabinet or my wardrobe. It's not going to uh, fill up. And it has multiple types of memory in it, both implicit memory and explicit memory. And I could give you a whole bunch, indeed, if you were one of my students, you would be getting a whole bunch of formal definitions and properties and all this sort of thing of each of them. And I could talk to you about six or eight different types of memory, but I'm not. I am going to try and make this more real by talking about pizza, if my mouse behaves. So I could say, if we were thinking about pizza, we could think about explicit long-term memory. So here's a fact for you. You can use this fact um, to help you in a pub quiz. They were allegedly invented in 1889 in Naples. So there's a piece of declarative, explicit factual information. A lot of what we teach in our curriculums takes this form. Um, and you might also have a kind of semantic general image in your head. So on the previous slide, I had a picture of a pizza. You probably thought, yeah, that's a that's pizza. That's what pizzas look like. Uh, but you also might have a specific memory. So you might have something called episodic memory. So episodic memory would be for an event, a moment perhaps in your autobiography. So if I asked you now, asked you to type it into the chat or tell me, uh, can you tell me the last time you had a takeaway pizza and you ate it with friends or family? You could probably tell me who was there. Um, whether you sat on the sofa and watched it in front of the telly, what was playing on the telly. You might remember that then Kathy had a fight with Peter and it all got out of hand or whatever. You, you'd have a whole episodic memory for this pizza eating event that is distinct from your general knowledge of what pizza is. So that's two types of, of explicit memory. And then you might have some implicit memory. So if you are a skilled pizza cooker, chef, um, you might know how to cook one. You might have seen those amazing people who can spin the dough on the end of their finger and just immediately make a perfect base. So they won't be able to tell you how they do that necessarily, they can just do it. So that doing it knowledge is procedural memory. And we also have kind of priming memory. So when you think about pizza, all sorts of implicit associations are likely to happen. So I could, if I had more time, show you a picture here that was ambiguous. You don't know whether it's spaghetti or um, ramen noodles. The thing is, because I've talked to you about pizza quite a lot in the last minute and a half, the chances are far more of you would now see it as spaghetti rather than noodles, because spaghetti as in another form of Italian food has been activated. In fact, probably, I am accidentally also making you feel a bit hungry and thinking about tea because I am also priming your associations with food. So um, if you've ever found yourself kind of standing upstairs thinking, what have I come up here for? And then you recreate this chain of events. Eventually, you will see that you probably had a whole bunch of sort of implicit associations formed. So those were four types of long term memory, which have different types of property. So if we think about implicit memory for a second, how do you think forgetting works? So here are two pictures of pizzas. 
only one of which you have seen before. I suspect you did not try and memorize the picture of the pizza that was three slides ago. And yet I feel pretty confident that most of you know which one it was. So if you think it's A, stick your hand up now. And B, and up you all go. So, yep. You know your you know your pizza EWTC attenders. So we call this recognition memory. Um, it's phenomenally accurate. So in a study done a long time ago, but I still really like um, this is a paired test. So um, we show people uh, twenty pictures of pizza, cats, dogs, whatever you like, uh, faces, pencils, you name it. And then two days later, we um, ask them in a situation like this, which of these two have you seen before? And if we show you 20 of these images, so 20 Bs, and then say two days later, which have you seen before? Around 99% of people are right two days later. But if I show these people 100 images, they're still 95% right two days later. If I show you 1,000 images, you're still 88% right. If I show you 10,000 images two days later, and you're not even expecting a test, remember, two days later, you're still 83% likely to get it right. So 83% of people still get these right, even if we show them 10,000 images. And one of my very, very, very favorite long-term follow-up psychology studies, this study was done first off in the late 60s, we followed up and found people who had been part of this original study. And 20 years later, many of them were still above chance. Some of them denied taking part in the study. They couldn't recollect taking part in the study, but implicitly they still could remember. And it overwhelms me and I'm so excited by this and I just wish all learning was that easy, but of course it isn't, we all know that. So if we think about forgetting um, and explicit long-term memory, I should have said, said explicit on the side and it says implicit, bad sharing. Um, explicit long-term memory, remembering is effortful. It takes time and energy for memories to be stored and their access also requires time and effort. So just for a second, can you tell me, you could unmute, you could stay in the chat, probably you would prefer uh, to do neither of those things and just think, uh, what were you doing on October the 20th in 2022? That might have felt easy, that might have felt difficult. I happen to remember I was in Verona, it feels quite nice memory. Uh, what, what about further back in time? Is that harder or is it easier? So what were you doing on the 24th of June, 2016? Now we're talking, you know, it's nearly seven years ago. Do you find that easier? Do you find that harder? And I would say that for most of you, probably that felt like an impossibly difficult task. You might have got lucky and October the 20th might be your birthday. So you might have um, a vivid memory of what you were doing um, three years ago on your birthday. But probably for most of you, you thought, oh, October, or oh, it'd be this point in the year, I was probably doing that. Might, maybe there was a store. I'd, it will be hard. Let me change the question and ask you for the same information, but in a different way. So what were you doing when you heard that Liz Truss had resigned as UK Prime Minister, which was October the 20th, 2022? What were you doing when you heard the result of the Brexit referendum, 24th of June, 2016? Now, most of you will have found those last two questions way easier and again, you might think, OK, so I remember where I was uh, when I heard the Brexit report result. Um, I was in Singapore. I don't travel everywhere. I haven't picked these examples just to show off what the stamps in my passport that I was in Singapore. And because I can remember where I was, I remember sort of everything else about that day starts coming back, who I had breakfast with, how depressed I was, all this kind of stuff. A good metaphor, or arguably a good metaphor, is that as long as you can find the right key, things that we think we've forgotten, we can recall. But it is a metaphor and there are dangers with that metaphor because our memory 
facts are not simply stored. We can't just reach in and get them out like we can if we unlock a file link cabinet and reach in and get the file out. Memories aren't inert, passive things. Memories are constructed and reconstructed as we need them. And the more we do this, the stronger they become. And this is this interaction really between episodic and explicit memory. So now actually, when you think about where you were when uh, you heard Liz Truss uh, resigned, this actual act of remembering that we've all done together right now will be changing your original memory. Um, that's why we've gotten very, very careful about asking leading questions in um, police interviews and in court, because we know that if we say something like how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, we'll get a different answer to if we say how far um, fast were the cars going when they bumped into each other. It isn't simply that we've changed the language. We seem to be changing your original memory for the event because memories aren't just passively stored. They're reconstructed as we reuse them. So that is long-term memory. So that was my model. I had all these boxes and arrows. I tried to show you how interactive everything was. I tried to show you that long-term memory doesn't just hang around at the end of the system occasionally being consulted, but it influences um, what we pay attention to, how cognitively demanding things are, and um, it's how we learn and interact and engage with the world. So is this my model of memory? It's clearly got a lot in common with the 1968 one, whilst also having quite a lot of difficult differences. And I would say it probably isn't quite my model of memory. So because my model of memory includes the body, we have an embodied cognitive system. So um, the way we think is influenced by the fact that we have a body. We're not disembodied brains in jars. Um, our minds are... Um, built up from the perceptual and motor experiences we have and those are re-established um, as we think about something so if i say to you she climbed up the tree your motor cortex is activated when you hear the word climbed even though you are just sitting in a chair and it also involves the tools the environment and other people so we know that in a complex workplace situation who you're with influences your memory you know that you don't need to memory to memorize everything you might know your your friend will mem will help remember that we know that the cultural tools that we've developed our language our visualizations our diagrams our graphs our maps are all of these are the ways that we think Re the way that the representations the cultural tools they're not just nice things they're fundamental to how the human mind works and probably why we've been such a successful species so speeding up just a tiny bit if teaching is architecture how does this influence how i teach bearing that cognitive model in place so i'm going to give you four metaphors that are based on this architectural idea I'm going to say that buildings need deep, strong foundations. I'm going to say we shouldn't overload a developing structure. I'm going to say let's revisit the building to check all is well and that different rooms have different features, so need different designs. So I'm not going to give you principles at this point. I'm just going to give you some metaphors. So I'm going to tell you that buildings require strong foundations. So we build deep into the ground so that our buildings last and so that we have strong, purposeful buildings that we can extend and maybe do things with that we didn't um, initially imagine that we needed to do. So what can we do to build strong groundworks? Well, we can remember that learning is for action. And our learners are trying to develop schemes that help make them sense of ideas that would otherwise be meaningless. And as I've tried to explain, memory is multimodal. So the rich sensory experiences that we can give learners to draw upon helps them learn and helps them remember because they recreate these body-based experiences cognitively uh, when they learn and when they remember. So actions that are well aligned with cognitive processes help us develop these schemes. That sounds very abstract. Let me give you some 
examples of actions I like to do with my learners. So actions that develop the scheme, interactions with relevant objects and artifacts. So, you know, if you're teaching fractions with uh, high blocks, if you're using Dean's blocks, if you're um, teaching advanced biochemistry and you have 3D molecular models, those objects and artifacts in themselves don't necessarily help us learn. It is the interactions that we do with those objects and artifacts. If they just sit there on the desk, we don't learn very much. We know that learners' relevant and actions with their bodies help them learn. So I taught um, people more about the physics of fish locomotion by getting them to enact fish locomotion in their body. The way that teachers gesture helps people learn. I don't know a teacher that doesn't describe the cardiovascular system, for example, without getting their hands out and showing the double pump in action. It's one of the great problems of this format is you can't see, I've just remembered to, to bring my hands up to gesture. And all of the research shows that teachers' relevant gesturing helps us learn because that is because if we observe others' relevant actions and actions and enactments, it helps us learn. And why do we, why is that the case? Well, partly because the same parts of our bodies and brains that are involved when we act are also, as I've said, um, they're also activated when others act and we see them acting. But conceptual metaphors and stories also help us learn. So it isn't just about doing things with our bodies, it's also um, making abstract ideas more meaningful. So, you know, conceptual metaphors, it comes out of something called conceptual metaphor theory. If you, you don't really need definitions of it because you have been exposed to so many conceptual metaphors today in this talk, the fundamental one being teaching is architecture. And then stories, you know, stories, um, I can't imagine teaching history without, you know, talking about Ethel the Viking, uh, but also, you know, Stories are ways that we can prompt inquiry questions in science. You know, why does Sharon say the Andes made of stardust? Or, you know, become meaningful contexts for mathematical problem solving. Um, so we can use stories and metaphors to make abstract ideas more meaningful. We can not give definitions of memory, but we can give pizza. And we can try and fade from concrete examples to abstractions. So in many situations, the concrete examples are a step along the way to the abstracted understanding we're trying to get to. So I don't think that we should always teach memory about pizza. I do think we should always teach memory using examples it would be in fading from a concrete example to an abstraction. And what about making them deep? So how can we deepen the level of cognitive engagement with the studied material? Because we don't just want to build in the ground, we want to build deep in the ground, because we know that the more we can increase cognitive engagement, the more people learn. So I could ask you a question now, and we could all un unmute. And I could say, how deeply engaged do you feel right now? Is this a good way to learn? Is watching me in a lecture theater or on a video a deep, Cognitive, deep cognitive engagement. And I suspect that a lot of people would say, no, it isn't. It isn't a good way to learn. In which case I would say from this theory's perspective, that is on you, not on me. Because it is the type of action that you do when you're engaged in learning that determines the level of cognitive engagement. So um, if you're just listening, letting it wash over you, teenagers on a Friday afternoon, you're just listening, you're passive. If you were trying to note down everything uh, I say as I say it using verbatim notes, not only are you writing very, very quickly, um, it is only an active strategy. But if you were being constructive, you might think of a question to ask me, or you might try and take notes from this in your own um, words, or you might be drawing a mind map, or you might be thinking, well, how do I integrate that into a lesson plan? Can I integrate it into a lesson plan? In which case you're being constructive. Or finally, you might be arguing about it. You might be sitting with a colleague and saying, I really don't think there's anything in, in this cognitive psychology. And she might be saying, well, yes, there is, there's that. And um, the more you have an evidence-based, dialogic, deep engagement with each other's ideas and the ideas you're hearing, the more interactive you are being according to this framework. Because 
this is um, Mickey Chi and Ruth Wiley's fave work, and they say that um, the deeper engagement you can have, the more you can move your learner from being passive to being active, which is adding overt motor or physical activity, to being constructed, so generating some new externalized output, be it a thought, be it a, a written thought, a verbalized thought, even a gesture. If you, the more you can do that, that goes beyond the information you're given, the more constructive you are, the more deeply engaged you are, the more you should learn, and the more opportunities you give for interaction, the more you should learn. What I can tell you from the evidence is there is very, very robust evidence that being constructive is much better for longer term learning, for building those deep groundworks and being active or passive. The evidence around interactive constructive is not as strong. It's not that interactive is a bad thing to do. It's just probably quite hard for people to do and perhaps constructive is uh, equally good in lots of situations. So the next metaphor was don't overwhelm fragile structures because when you're putting something up, if you do that, it can all collapse on you. So attention can be overwhelmed. We've learned that. And we know that learners aren't able to manage multiple simultaneously demanding tasks. However, if somebody tells you a magic number that says learners can attend for 20 minutes, they can attend for 50 minutes, they can attend for only 45 minutes and then they can't attend anymore. That is false. There is no magic number out there. What we do know is it's much easier to gain than maintain attention. It's hard cognitively for you and for um, anybody that we interact with to maintain attention. So we have to keep bringing people back towards us. And here I do think cognitive um, psychology, straightforward cognitive psychology lets us down. We have to move out of just thinking about memory to start thinking about curiosity and engagement and, and, and motivation and really engaging uh, with learners. If we're to help them manage the fact that attention naturally is difficult to maintain. We don't want to overwhelm children's working memory. So we think that implicit long-term memory, it has, it has roughly adult-like properties by the time you're leaving preschool, but explicit long-term memory and explicit um, and working memory does not. It takes a while for children to develop the same working memory capacity as an adult. That's partly of biological factors, and it's partly because as working memory depends on what you already know, then the more you know, the bigger your working memory capacity. So we don't want to overwhelm young children's working memory so we can help them chunk, so they can draw upon their prior knowledge in the way that phone number example may, might have helped you succeed. We can help them externalise their knowledge when something is in the world, be it in a drawing, a mind map, writing, or just the way you've arranged objects on a desk. That will help them understand. And we do need to think about ways of minimising unnecessary load. So splitting your attention between two different competing things really harms working memory. So we might want to um, not suggest to teenagers that they uh, revise listening to heavy lyric based music, but turn the, the, the radio off. Radio? How old am I? Turn the, the music off or listen to music without lyrics, for example. And we also want to think about using scaffolding. I'm a big fan of scaffolding theory. Um, it was my PhD supervisor's uh, theory. So I was kind of brought up in scaffolding theory. So the idea of scaffolding theory is you put the structures in place that are needed for learning, always looking to, to, mil to remove them the second the learner can succeed without them. So they're not a permanent solution. Nobody wants to see a building covered in scaffolding. And for our learners, we're trying to take that scaffolding away so they become able to act without it. But it might be needed at the beginning of tasks, when they're younger, when things get more complicated. So how do you make that building last? We put all this effort into helping uh, young people learn something. It's no use if you can't remember it tomorrow. What, how do we make learning last? So how do we build for long-term memory? So 
For explicit long-term memory, we've already seen how easy it is to build for implicit long-term memory. So we don't really have to bother about that. That's automatic. But for explicit long-term memory, um, firstly, there isn't a particular trick that should really separate learning from memory. Um, if you build deep foundations and build on solid ground, learning is better. So the more meaningful you make learning in the first place, the easier it is for things to remember it. But also perhaps we should revisit the building. So remembering something makes it easier to remember it again, especially if you've made it more, more meaningful. So this is where some of the ideas around retrieval practice come in. But remember that um, really retrieval practice is great. If you've heard of it, it's a way of forcing yourself to remember things. Remembering something does help you remembering it again, uh, but it's best seen as a, as a technique that builds on deep foundations and solid understanding. And just a, rem a reminder, when we revisit something, it's not the buildings there. When we revisit a building, the way our memory works is we're rebuilding that building every time we think about it. So revisiting is really rebuilding. And then plan different designs for different purposes. What I mean by this is that memory for skills is different from memory for concepts. So when we're learning a skill, be it uh, writing or playing the guitar or driving, you know, these sort of skill-based activities, when people are first learning to do something, every aspect of learning to do that can overwhelm working memory, attention, and it makes learning and performance really, really effortful. And I don't need to tell you that because all of you have learned to write learned, many of you will have learned to drive or play a musical instrument. Um, so when you are learning a skill like that, at the beginning, it is phenomenally effortful. Sometimes we can therefore think about using a worked example. Worked examples show people how to solve the problem, but worked examples are a form of scaffolding. And the thing about scaffolding is that we put them in at the beginning and then we take them away again. So if you're gonna use a worked example, please remember to fade. I have met schools where their children have stopped solving problems themselves. They're only studying the solutions of others. That's a great beginner strategy. It's a terrible long-term strategy. Uh, but still, skill performance um, can take many hours to achieve. And I don't know many shortcuts. Um, I can think about helping uh, learners gain and draw upon their prerequisite prior knowledge. Then I'm providing opportunities for deliberate space practice with feedback so it's got to be practice of sufficient difficulty there is no it's best if having learned something like i don't know how to subtract um, and carry you've learned that you've got it conceptually but you don't practice that you practice it in the context of learning without borrowing learning um multiplication you, you practice it up in a mixed way and obviously feedback is better and it can be challenging which is one of the reasons i like to work around educational games because i think skill-based learning works, works can work really well if we get the educational game right so that's my pitch that's how i think cognitive psychology and cognitive science can help but when i'm designing my own educational um, activities with my own students I try not only to think about cognition. I never develop a lesson myself based only thinking about the fact they've got a limited working memory capacity or even that their cognitive system involves long-term knowledge, driving attention and driving what they'll find um, difficult. I think about the whole human. So I think about curiosity, engagement, motivation, self-efficacy, um, identity, uh, how, how they're feeling, whether they've got enough food, to eat, you know, I think a solution that suggests to teachers that all you need to know is cognitive psychology, I wouldn't want to be associated with that solution. I think we shouldn't attempt to build on an island and that island be how does memory work? And I also think that learning is better if we consider everybody as an educational arch architect. So I've said that I think as educators, practitioners, museum curators, teachers, college lecturers, uh, nursery workers. I think of all of us as educational architects, but I also think there's a lot to, to learn, a lot of benefits to get if our um, children and young people learn about how learning works and become architects of their own learning. So I've got some principles 
I'm not a big principle person, I'm a metaphor person. They're on the slides and EWE has the slides and we'll make them available. But I'll end then on this slide uh, roughly on time. So I'll learn, I'll end on this slide. So what you don't know is I propose some very boring academic titles to the EWC and the EWC sexed me up. It took away my boring academic title and gave me unlocking the mysteries of learning. And I went away and I looked up what mystery meant in the Oxford English Dictionary. And what it sort of means is a something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. So for me, maybe for you, learning doesn't need to be think about as mysterious. Maybe we can understand and explain it. Learning is embodied. Our cognitive system didn't develop by accident. The way we think is an interaction between the fact that um, we are human beings and our brains are found in our body. We know that learning is social and it happens in a context and that context matters. And I haven't had a lot of chance to talk about it today. Um, if you were to find me in Nottingham, it's all I'd talk to you about, but that learning is representational. So we, as a species, we can learn by imitation and observation, but we have another tool to our toolbox. And that is the fact that we can represent our understanding in the external world. We can create a language to talk with, but then we can write it down. We can draw a picture on a cave painting, or we can look at an augmented reality app. And learning to me therefore is increasingly representational. So for me, learning isn't mysterious but it is lovely and I'm very fond of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, an action-packed, content-filled presentation. And what you might not have been able to spot is the active discussion going on in the chat and the many people now offering their thanks and people asking for recordings and copies um, of the presentation. We're into the Q&A part um, of the afternoon now, and I've got a couple of questions that I'd like to start off with. The, the first one being a bit of a hot topic, and perhaps that means you can probably guess where this is going. And this is from Abby Jones. So Abby Jones has asked, well, Abby Jones says, first of all, this is so interesting. Uh, I think many people are currently agreeing with that in the chat. And the question is, I wonder what Sharon's thoughts are on the impact of AI on learning and thinking in particular, if it is a help or hindrance. Any thoughts? Um yeah, I will say it's yes. AI <laughs> is a tool that we have developed and it is up to us how we use that tool to help us learn. So there is a Society for Artificial Intelligence in Education that's been going on for, I think, about 40 years. And what I like about the goal of the society is that they define it as creating a, AI in education is about building systems that care. That was the fundamental building, cry, crying call of um, the Artificial Intelligence in Education Society. However, what we are seeing at the moment is a lot of um, generative AI models that mm. are taking away some of the sustained effortful engagement that we would like learners to do and taking that work from them. Um, so my answer to the question is, if we can find ways to build effortful engagement around what an, a generative AI model is doing, then we can, it's a tool to help us learn. If it isn't, if we've just exported our thinking to the AI, then it isn't a tool to help us learn. So I think it's up to us. Um, and I think we should be in that space as educators demanding mm. the kind of AI that we want. Agreed. I mean, this is a hot topic in universities, of course, and it's very much about the latter use of AI, that is to use it as a generative tool, taking away people's engagement with the topic and their own um, writing often. Uh, so we now have a question from Ben Lester. Uh, ben has asked, are there particular techniques or technologies that you think can be effective as aids to increase cognitive engagement in the classroom? So... Yes. So I think that list of 
activities, so gesturing, enactment, relevant interaction with objects and artifacts, stories, metaphors, the more we can get things like that into our learning, the better. Although obviously I was being slightly facetious when I said, if you are being passive as a learner while I talk to you, that's your responsibility, not mine. Um, obviously it is really difficult in this particular form of learning to really encourage um, deep cognitive engagement. Um, you will have seen me attempt various times to, to enhance that, regaining your attention by bringing examples in, by asking you to do things in the chat, because I'm all too well aware that as we get to the end of the day, attention is flagging, people are tired, they don't want to do that. Um, I do love serious games, but most of the games that are available for schools don't pass my criterion of a good game because for me a good game please contact me later if you want to talk about this because I do work in, in games for learning to me a good game is one that integrates fun and learning and often the games we have available for school we call chocolate covered broccoli so we've taken an unpalatable bit of, bit of learning like your multiplication facts and we put it in the context of a game and you play the game for a bit and then you have to answer some multiplication questions or do something like that. Those are not very effective games. Really effective games are games that intrinsically integrate the fun and the learning. So darts is a beautiful example of an intrinsically integrated game, really. You're having to practice the maths in order to do the game well, but lots and lots of our games don't do that. But when they do it well, they're brilliant because one of my um, research participants, once an 11 year old, described um, a game that I'd uh, developed with my doctoral student, Jake Habgood, as subliminal advertising with maths. That it was helping her learn and she was only aware that she, she'd learned at the end. Very articulate 11 year old. Well, it was indeed. And actually, I think what you've done is, is addressed um, another question which has been asked um, by Jess Stock, uh, who one of Jess's questions was, you mentioned skill-based games, do you have any examples that are easily applicable in the classroom? I mean, you mentioned darts as a, a good example of a skill-based game. Do, do you want to give any other examples? Jess has a couple of other questions which I can bring you back to as well. But um, So darts is a good one. Um, It's hard because a lot of the games I like are available as research prototypes rather than available for teachers to use in classrooms. If you've got my email, I could probably go through my notes. Um, a lot of the games that have come out of the year of code are quite good if you are teaching computational thinking and, and things like that. I'm working at the moment with, with colleagues to make escape room games to teach medieval history and to use uh, Minecraft to teach data science. But at the moment, these things are in universities as we trial them and try and get them right rather than easily available to every um, educator. But if you email me with a topic, uh, I'll see what I can find from my, from my notes. That's a, a very generous offer, expect to be bombarded. Uh Jess has a couple of other questions, um, not specifically about uh, games. So the first one from, from Jess was, what practical techniques to support students' memory retention and meaningful learning have been most effective in classrooms? And then there's a question about uh, any practical advice you might have to create um, educational settings which are richer sensory environments or action-based. So any advice on those? So the, so the first thing I would say is probably anything where you find yourself being able to encourage learners to be constructive. So going beyond the information that is given to produce an externalized output will be more successful than a hands-on, minds-off, simply active or a rather passive look at this screen and take notes or just listen to me while I talk at you. So the more constructive you can be, the better. There are lots of examples, say in that Chi and Wiley paper, of being constructive. My personal favourite, as Andy knows, is getting learners to cognitively engage by drawing or drawing-based modelling. 
that's one of the ones I use quite a bit in, in my own teaching. Um, but there are other strategies, explaining to one another, teach backs, uh, where you get a learner to teach another, reciprocal questioning for, for dialogue. I'm very fond of um, whole body enactments. So if you can imagine, you know, I'm sure many of you do this, but if you're, say, in, in primary science and you're teaching uh, the movement of bodies in the solar system, if you get enactment going of rotation and revolution, then we know that that will help people learn. And we do know that if you are interested in supporting factual memory, that retrieval practice does help. But it doesn't, it's not a magic bullet. And in lots of places in the world right now, it's being treated as a, as, as a magic bullet. So it will, if you remember, if you ask students to remember things that they'd learned previously, like what you were doing on October the 20th, 20th, 2022, that will help them remember it again. So I would say a com the more constructive you can be and the more attempts to help you rebuild your learning, the better. Rich sensory experiences in the classroom. I think that really depends on where you are. I am not a fan of... Um, merely decorative images, but I am a fan of providing um, objects and artifacts and representations with which learners can interact because relevant actions with meaningful objects is just so much better than just having the meaningful objects there. Thank you. We've got a couple of other questions. We are running out of time, but I would like to squeeze these in if we possibly can. Uh, from Sylvia Davis asks, uh, increasingly we are seeing technology being used to engage learners in their learning. What is your view of getting the best out of technology and the, um, the long-term impact on memory? So how do we get the best out of technology? Um, by people like us taking control <laughs> of what is put into our preschools, our schools, our, our, our mm. workplaces. Um, it's easier said than done. It's, you know, that's what learning scientists like to do. We like to try and understand learning in order to design effective educational experiences, be that with technology or not. Um, so partly it's about having the right conversations. It's about not letting the technologies that enter our workplaces and our schools, our colleges, be the ones that tech companies want us to use, but which educators want to use to employ there's there's something in the publishing world called the thumb test and the thumb test is when you are in a book fair and you're an educational publisher and you're trying to sell your book and you sell it by making it look glossy so that when a buyer comes in and they flick through they go this is a nice book i fear that sometimes that's how we treat mm, technology yeah. we go this this passes yeah. the thumb test so um yeah I don't have magic technological answers, but I do have a, a mission that it's us that should be in control of them. And we shouldn't, I don't think we should be afraid of technology. We, mm -hmm. It's silly, in my view, to completely ban it in schools and colleges and preschools and workplaces. Um, with our responsibility for young people is that they will work in a, in a world full of, full of technology, it's our responsibility to help them learn how to engage with that um, and exploit it when it's brilliant and tell them to put their phones away and not look at them when it's not, personally. Thank you. Uh, one last one, so quick one. This is from Abby Jones, um, who asked another question earlier on. Uh, asks what are the key signs to look out for when a learner is getting overwhelmed with information and how can this be practically addressed when often class sizes are quite large yes and i've had 250 at one time so i think there's a couple of possibilities one is that you attempt to um, model that for every single person in your class and go crazy yourself as a teacher because you don't have the cognitive capacity to adapt to everybody's individual working memory capacity at that moment in time. 
I probably wouldn't do that. Probably I would be thinking about the nature of the task I'm asking learners to engage in and how likely they are to have engaged in it before. And then I don't, and then giving them opportunities to externalize what they understand from it um, rather than as a, um, you know, attempt to help try and get them to memorize everything. When we when we give our poor little learners really long verbal instructions and then wonder why they don't follow them, it's like us when we stop to ask somebody directions to the nearest coffee shop and by instruction number three, we've stopped being able to take in any new information. It's not that we're not listening. It's not that we're not trying. It's just that we've overloaded the capacity of our working memory and... Um, with the best one in the world, we cannot rehearse new verbal information whilst also taking in and processing new ones. So um, perhaps just thinking about what we're asking learners to do and remembering it's not too, it's quite easy to overwhelm their working memory capacity, but there's so many things we can do to help. We don't just have to treat them as, as fragile. If, if we treat them, if we put the scaffolding in and if we give them lots of opportunity for meaning, meaningful engagement and to build on their prior knowledge, they can do amazing things. And I think that is a perfect way to finish. So that is lovely. Thank you so much, Erin. That's been every bit as interesting and engaging as I was expecting it would be and fitted the build up very nicely. And the comments in the chat are also reinforcing that we had more questions uh, than we actually had time to address. So there might be a way for us to, to pick up on that outside of this presentation. But thank you once again. I think I'm handing back over to Ethne now. Yeah, can I just say on behalf of um, everyone who has watched this this evening, at, a, at the end of a very long day, that that was absolutely fascinating. And you'll have seen that from the chat that we had and the number of participants who are still here at half past five in the afternoon. I love the fact that it was evidence-based and practical simultaneously, and the fact that the metaphors have allowed us to ground some of our thinking in things that are really, really interesting, exciting, and memorable as well. Um, so you have practiced what you preach there. Um, so I'm just going to close this um, extremely good professionally speaking event by thanking you all so much for your participation this evening and to you particularly Sharon and Andrew to you for hosting the event. Thank you.